I'm right. I would like to extend a great welcome to Martin Walker. Thank you, Brian, and uh, thanks once again for uh, everyone coming along tonight. And uh, I must be doing something right if this is my fir a fifth session. So I think I'm uh, probably only second to Brian as the person who's spoken the most at these meetings. And uh, I Thanks. should say third, because there's probably fresh air in between Brian and me. <laughs> That's a long way. But, uh, Brian was right. Um, you know, philately has been a passion of mine since I was a school kid. And, uh, and when I family moved to Gawler, that was in 1972, I was already collecting postcards at the time. And uh, one of the most elusive postcards that I ever found was the one for the first airmail flight that came to Gawler in 1917. And the, those things are so rare, in fact, it was 15 years before I ever saw one come on the market for an opportunity to buy one, so they're uh, really tough things to find. Well, pre-seed uh, the 1917 thing, um, tonight's talk is about this gentleman here, Robert Graham Carey, and uh, the airmail he did in 1917. Uh, this is the front cover of a biography that was done by uh, his granddaughter um, and it was published back in 2004. Very good biography if you ever see one in a second-hand bookshop, out of print now sadly. But it's a very good family history and a very good history of aviation and motor car dealing. Uh, Kerry was a motor car dealer who had a bit of a passion for flying. Now, actual aviation which involves flying, it's a bit... It's sad there's no barnets here tonight, but after Custance and Whitford made their hop in Bolivar, the next person to turn up in Adelaide with a plane to attempt to fly it was A.W. Jones. And he arrived here in December 1913 with this plane. It's, a, it's an Australian-built copy of the Cauldron biplane. And Jones uh, took it around the country giving exhibition flights, but he, he really wasn't very good at it. He made the first flight over Adelaide on the 2nd of January 1914 and I, about four days later he was attempting another flight and he crashed his plane at Cheltenham Racecourse and made a real mess of himself. So much so that it really destroyed his confidence for flying. He continued to tour around Australia and he did South Australian country towns and in fact he did actually come to Gawler on the 4th of March 1914. He attempted a flight from the Evanston Racecourse he actually got it airborne and crashed about two miles away. Um, so there are no known photographs of his appearance in Gawler because it was unannounced. Um, he actually arrived on a Wednesday, uh, a couple of days before the Bunyip uh, came out to announce his uh, demonstration flight. So, so that's quite sad and it's uh, fairly well lost in obscurity, his visit to Gawler. Uh, as I said, he lost his confidence after that crash and uh, pretty much gave up the flying soon after that. The next aviator to turn up in Adelaide uh, with, a, with a passion was a Frenchman called Maurice Guillot. Now, Guillot came to Australia with this plane. It was a Blériot monoplane. Now, the Blériot monoplane was the type that made the first crossing of the English Channel just a few years earlier in 1909. And Guillot had it adapted by widening the wings uh, so that he could do stunt flying, loop the loop and things like that in this particular plane. It was powered by a 50 horsepower engine. <laughs> Imagine that, you've probably got more mowers that are more powerful than that. And uh, to give you a, an idea of the scale and the size, you could probably fit two of them in this room. So it was a fairly very small plane, put together, yeah, wood, canvas and wire, as most of those planes in those days were, and uh, a rotary engine at the front. Uh, Gio appeared in Adelaide in June 1914 and, and did some very successful flying exhibitions. Uh, this is an artist's illustration of Gio over Adelaide, and it's a bit dark because there's streetlights on. We can actually make out the GPO and the town hall and the sketch down the bottom. Uh, so that's the Foldings Journal, which was a monthly journal uh, done by the Foldings in, in Adelaide. Uh, whilst he was in Adelaide, um, attempts were being made by his uh, aviator rival in Australia, a gentleman called Wizard Stone. And Wizard Stone's agents had organised with the Postmaster General's Department to fly an airmail from Melbourne to Sydney. However, Wizard Stone met the fate of many of these early aviators and he crashed his plane and broke both of his legs. So that took him out of action. Uh, Wizard Stone's agent contacted Gio and asked him if he would take over and fly the airmail. 
Uh, GEO eventually did fly that air mail from Melbourne to Sydney, uh, but not under uh, Wizard Stone's agent, but under his own agent. And of course, he pocketed the fee and pocketed the cash and pocketed the glory for flying the first air mail in Australia, Melbourne to Sydney, which in 1914 was the longest official air mail ever to have been attempted in the world. And, uh, it took him about three days, but uh, with nine hours of flying time in that three days. Now, Graham Carey was a, a motor dealer, so he was born in England in 1874 and came out to Australia as a youngster and built up a, a very successful business in Ballarat. So this is his motor garage in 1916, so you can all see it was already a fairly thriving enterprise then. And Carey got bitten by the flying bug. And uh, in World War I, of course, there were a lot of restrictions about planes and flying in Australia. The Department of Defence decreed that only uh, the Army could uh, fly, because the Air Force hadn't even been created at that stage, um, without, uh, without any permission. There were very few flyers in Australia during World War I, apart from the Department of Defence people, and Carey was one of them. Now, what Carey, desperate to learn how to fly, is, thanks again, the next one, he bought Morris Guillaume's plane. Now, Maurice Guillaume, being French, uh, when the war broke out, he mm -hmm. hightailed it back to France and enlisted, but he left his plane in Australia in storage, and uh, it basically it was a case of uh, he hadn't paid the rent, the marriage feeds came in, and so an agreement was made for Carey to buy this plane. He got a, a gentleman called Edwin Prosser to teach him how to fly it, and in 1916 he became the first Australian to obtain a civilian pilot's license in Australia. Mm. So, so he's pretty, pretty passionate about it. In 1916 and 17, he was flying this particular plane around Western Victoria and Ballarat giving demonstration flights. He based himself at the Bacchus Marsh race course. And uh, in the uh, biography that I mentioned, there's some, some wonderful correspondence reproduced from the Ballarat Town Council and himself, mainly about complaints from the farmers um, uh, about his aeroplane frightening the cattle and frightening horses and, and things like this as of, were as of the day. Now, in October 1917, the Commercial Travellers Association were organising an event to raise funds for the Army nurses. This was a pretty big event. It was held on the Adelaide Oval and attracted many thousands of people. Now, this was the advertisement in the paper the week prior. I'll point this out. It's October the 20th and take a bit of a note of the picture there of uh, Carey. Uh, Ian, can you just go back one shot? Um, this particular photo is of him at Bacchus Marsh. It's sometimes claimed to be Florrie Robinson in Gawler. It's not. I've studied these photos with a great deal and a good magnifying glass, and this is definitely Bacchus Marsh. Uh, prior to coming to Adelaide, he was doing <coughs> joy lights, and he took up over 300 passengers in 1916 and 17 on joy flights uh, here you with, with, without a single incident, uh, I should say. So his motto is safety first. <laughs> we'll go back to the next one. Um, I point out that this ad is dated the 20th, and this is about four days before Kerry and his plane actually arrived in Adelaide. So um, that's of some significance when uh, we see some later pictures. Next one. Now, Carey was doing flights in Western Victoria before and selling cards for people to as you know, mementos and fundraising of his trips. Uh, this particular card caught my interest because it was written down the side, somebody's bought this at the Army Nurses Carnival in 1917. So it particularly dates to his visit to Adelaide. Now, my suspicion is that he probably was selling these. Uh, the plane was on view and the lawns of Government House for a few days prior to the flight over the Army Carnival and he was probably selling the things madly to raise funds to help pay his expenses. Okay. Right, go on the next one. Sorry. That's the one. Now, the Army Nurses Carnival, as I mentioned, was organised by the Commercial Travellers and Warehousemen's Association. The, uh, this is the, pro the program for the day's events. 
and uh, there's a whole page in that program devoted to Kerry's visit, which is the next slide. And we have here the great aeroplane flight over Adelaide by Mr. R. Graham Carey. Now, the flight, he, when he came from Melbourne, he brought with him a letter from the Governor of Victoria to greet the Governor of South Australia, and the letter was to be delivered by, by in this particular flight. The plan was to land that plane on Adelaide Oval in the middle of the carnival. Mm. Um, however, the Adelaide authorities said, no way, that never happened. <laughs> This little bit down here, talking about the aerial post, um, invited people to send letters to be carried on that flight to land on the Adelaide Oval uh, at two and six each, as obviously as fundraisers for the Army nurses. So because he never landed, that particular aerial post never happened. So that left him with a problem of how to deliver the letter from the Governor of Victoria. So he came up with an idea that he'd drop it in, by parachute over the Adelaide Oval. The problem is uh, on the day, there was a horrible, horrible, um, blustery storm came across the af that afternoon. Uh, we'll go to the, the next slide. Which we'll... this, this one here. That's a storm. Yes. It pixelated everything. All right. This is a, this is Captain Bruce of the state uh, recruiting. Enlistment uh, Bureau in, fr in front of the, the plane uh, about Friday prior to it being taken off. I'll put in on here too that this particular plane has a Union flag painted on the tail, so it's a good indicator as what it should have looked like when it was in Adelaide. Mm -hmm. And the next one is him about to take off from the, the, the secret aerodrome, which was actually next to the Enfield terminus, uh, tram terminus, which is about where the Sefton Park shopping centre is now. So that's a genuine picture of him in Adelaide. And the next one shows him about to take off. And I hadn't noticed this before, but clutched in his hand, he's holding something. And I'm pretty sure that's the letter attached to the parachute that he's going to drop on the Adelaide Oval to be delivered to the governor. Now the problem on that day was, as I mentioned, there was a huge storm came across and he sort of tried to calculate where he would need to drop the parachute to land on the oval so it could be delivered to the governor. Well, the wind caught it. It was eventually found the next day on, on the railway tracks next to the Woodville railway station. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, missed it by that much. <laughs> uh, it did eventually get delivered to the governor, uh, but I've not been able to track down where that letter is. I would have thought it should have been able to be, uh, it would have been preserved in some official correspondence file. Now the other thing that Kerry did on the day, he dropped leaflets to promote the Liberty Loan. Uh, the leaflets well described in the newspaper and it should look like this except it would have the word Adelaide instead of Melbourne there. Now, these leaflets are so scarce um, that only the ones from Melbourne and Sydney are known. And it's, it's really frustrating when you think that tens of thousands of these things were dropped and yet you can count the survivors on your fingers. It's you know, very, very astonishing. Now, this is also a picture entitled uh, Carey and his Blerio at Adelaide. If you look at the background, it's Bacchus Marsh. <laughs> so it also proves very frustrating trying to find out what these uh, particular pictures are. Um, there's also superimposed on these pictures of his plane in flight during the day. And right at the very top, you might be able to see the, the plane in a loop. Uh, that was actually a, um, an unintended loop. His plane actually got caught by a gust of wind, and it basically just flipped him straight up and over. And of particular interest when you read the newspaper reports of that was that although he had a safety strap in his plane, he never wore it. So <laughs> how he survived these things is quite astonishing. Okay, we've gone to the next one. I'm going to blow this one up. In the following week, he did some joy flights over Adelaide and the suburbs, and on those flights, he dropped the Liberty Loan leaflets, as mentioned before, and he also dropped these leaflets. Um, so, a memento of the war if you were hit by a bomb rather than a leaflet. Um, these leaflets were put out by the State Recruitment Council, and they were encouraging people to join the uh, reinforcements, the enlistment enlistments in 1917. So 
So that's one side of it. This is the, the other side of it. Sorry about that. I have to pinch these from an auction catalogue website. And these were dropped on to the Monday and Tuesday of the following week. Once again, tens of thousands of them dropped. It's probably five known copies of this thing. So, uh, there. Now, at some stage between those at flights early, well, the flights early in the week actually stopped. His, uh, his tail, um, tail skid on his plane hit a surveyor's peg in the uh, field at Enfield and it shattered the skid so the plane had to be repaired. Now, at some stage, the committee of the Gawler Red Cross contacted Carey, um, presuming it was probably through the Commercial Travellers Association, and asked if he could fly his plane to Gawler to give an exhibition over the Red Cross Carnival, which was happening on November the 3rd. Permission must have been given, and at the same time, permission was also given for him to carry an official airmail uh, by the acting Deputy Postmaster General at the time, uh, Mr Monfries. So the, the ad that just, just popped up was in the uh, Adelaide newspapers a bit earlier in the week, uh, promoting the event. Now this is the Red Cross event. This is a new photo that's been discovered of the, the march through Murray Street for the Red Cross Fair. Um, so this is what was going on in the town. And the rest of the event was actually on the Gawler Oval, not the Gawler Race Course. So about three o'clock in the afternoon, Carey was due to appear. Never turned up. And uh, what had happened was that his plane had some engine trouble shortly after takeoff from Enfield, so he put down in a field uh, at Islington, repaired the engine, got it going again, but the field was quite small, so when he tried to uh, take off again, the, the rear skid on the plane caught the top of a fence wire, and that just stopped the plane dead. And of course it just went pancaked down, and did enough damage to say no more flying today. So that should be the next... Uh, slide there. Now I mentioned the official airmail. This is a card actually written by Monfries, the Deputy Postmaster General, to his daughter. And you'll note on here, by, by mail by aviator Graham Carey via Gawler. And you'll notice the Adelaide postmark is dated the 3rd of November. Now, this is quite a significant thing in philatelic terms because the 3rd of November date there and the arrival date of the 23rd of November it just proves that that thing was held in Adelaide and then carried on the subsequent flight a few yep, weeks later. Same as it is now. That's <laughs> probably quicker. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, whilst Kerry was in Adelaide, um, the mechanical aspects of the plane were attended to by, let me shrink it back down again, uh, by this company, Duncan and Fraser. And Duncan and Fraser were very famous carriage makers in Adelaide and they made a lot of the Adelaide trams and the like. And uh, you'll notice that this card is dated the 3rd and it's been written by, by Duncan, dressed in Mr Barnett, so um, that's there. And um, this card is actually in the British Library in one of their collections and I only got a scan of this about three weeks ago uh, because I, I saw the other side of it on display uh, when I was there in 2012. So I was quite astonished to see this. This is now the second known card from Duncan and Fraser carried on this flight. So one could measure that they sent cards to all their Gawler customers um, as a means of promoting the flight. Also carried on that 3rd of November flight was this letter. This is one from the Mayor of Adelaide. Not to the Mayor of Gawler, but to the Governor, because the Governor was in Gawler for the Red Cross Fair. So this would have been held over uh, until the 23rd and carried again and eventually delivered to the, the Governor back in Adelaide um, probably on the 26th of November and there is some notations on there that he did reply to this letter back to the Mayor but of course those replies would have not gone by air uh, Could you, uh, that's held by these Could you read that um, out? Um, of, we, is we it worth here. Is Yeah, it? Can, should be able to blow that blow up the text Verbally it's hard to see. Just, just make it a bit bigger, thanks again. Getting it right. Yeah. So, the top line was, I am advised that the first aerial mail in the history of South Australia will be dispatched to Gawler today. I am taking the opportunity of sending to you, by this novel means, the greetings of the Council and citizens of Adelaide. I trust that the effort of Gawler to 
uh, augment the funds of the Red Cross Society with which you are associating yourself will be attended with every success. Mm. Thank you. Faithfully by Isaacs. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that is in the Governor's correspondence in the State Records Office. Now, this is a memorial that not many people know about. It's actually in a thing well, called good. Irish Harp Park, which is on Regency Road. Uh, Regency Road used to be called Irish Harp Road. And it's a monument that's supposed to mark the place where he crashed on the 3rd of November. Uh, the only trouble is it's uh, fairly well documented in the newspapers that he crashed west of the railway line in the grazing paddocks of the sewage farm there. Uh, whereas this is east of the railway line, so he's about two miles out uh, on this particular monument, but um, it's still there and might be worth a trip for a photograph. And uh, that was put up in uh, 1994. Now this particular photo comes from the, uh, the Duncan family archives of Duncan and Fraser. And I mentioned before that every, they, they attended to Kerry's need, so uh, when he crashed his plane, the plane was uh, pulled apart, loaded up on an Oakland 6 and towed back to Adelaide. And this is actually a picture of the plane being repaired in Duncan and Fraser's workshop. I only discovered that earlier this year as we've been hunting for things. Now, I mentioned before that all the people were stood around in the Gorda Oval waiting to see the plane fly over on the afternoon of the Red Cross Carnival. And of course it didn't. Um, there were actually special trains put on. This was such a big event because nobody had seen a plane fly over Gawler before. Uh, trains were put on to bring people from Kapunda and, and other places so they could see the plane. There were special trains come up from Adelaide so that they could see the plane flying. There was a big crowd in Gawler. And of course when it didn't show up, uh, the Red Cross Committee were somewhat embarrassed. And of course the, the Bar Humbug crowd that Gawler is famous for all said it was a big con just to get them there to donate money for the Red Crosses. Uh, carnival. So the ladies, uh, Dora I and uh, E.A. Smith, E.A. Smith was the town clerk, but these, these are the two really the secretaries of the committee who worked really hard to persuade Kerry to come back and complete his uh, engagement to fly over the town and also to deliver the airmail. Uh, the only problem was that Kerry's appearance fee was £35, which was a lot of money in those days, and it's I found out later that uh, some of the citizens of Gawler actually put in five pounds each to cover the fees. Um, uh, one of them was the mayor's wife, uh, Mrs. Pyle was another one that's been mentioned in the correspondences that I've seen. So his appearance fee was covered by private individuals and presumably they got their money back when uh, people paid to put letters on the uh, airmail or come and visit the machine and inspect the machine at six minutes ahead in the tent on the race course when it, when it did eventually appear. So here's an advertisement that comes from the Bunyip, so it mentions here the postcards, the flight, the visit of the thing. So this was going to, the flight was on the 23rd of November. Now another postcard, also from the collection of the British Library, um, is quite significant uh, really. It's a card written to Dora I, the secretary, and the message is written by W. H. Cox, the Mayor of Gawler, thanking her for her persistence in getting the, uh, the flight completed. Keeps going. We'll move on to the next one. Now, in 1935, Nelson Eustace, who some of you would have had some dealings with and in earlier airmail events, advertised in the Gawler Bunyip trying to buy these cards for his collection. Nelson was also a bit of a wheeler dealer. And uh, that advertising in the Bunyip prompted some letters to the editor and uh, the like. And one of the letters to the editor was actually written by Dora I, who explained the background of it from her point of view and mentioned that she had received two postcards on the flight. So this is the second one, uh, which is now resides in my safe at home. Uh, some of the cards are obviously autographed on the back and inscribed to indicate that it was carried on the first aerial mail. So that's the back of the door of my card. Now, Kerry stayed in Gawler for the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, 
Uh, the de-demitizer joy flights would be available, um, but once again, engine problems, weather, all prevailed against him. So the only joy flight he actually made, he carried this lady, Florrie Robinson, uh, on a joy flight. Uh, Florrie Robinson was the daughter of the Robinsons who uh, were, were put him up for the weekend he was here. Now they did organise a return airmail on the Monday the 26th, and they actually preserved the mail bag and the tag um, in the museum in Adelaide, and probably, um, the, I think that was probably on display when the Postal Museum was here in Adelaide, but when the Postal Museum closed down, a lot of the material got transferred to Melbourne. Melbourne separated the bag from the tag, and the tag's now in the archival collection of Australia Post, and the bag is in storage somewhere, uh, which is somewhat unfortunate they've been separated, but uh, yeah, so that's the tag with the wax seal at the Gawler Post Office. Now I mentioned uh, before that um, some dignitaries sent letters. So the Mayor of Gawler received two letters. One was from the President of the Commercial Travellers Association. The other one was from the Speaker of the House of Assembly. And I found out that his correspondence files were held by the State Library, so I had to search through all of those and we found the reply, the thank you letter back from the Mayor of Gawler to no, the Speaker there. So, quite find it. Now, the Blerio aeroplane on its return <coughs> flight was, well, the return flight was the last time Kerry flew that plane. It stayed in the shed for quite a while. Now, the reason for that is that by the end of 1917, come 1918, Spare parts for an old aeroplane were getting hard to come by. The engine in this plane had to be stripped, cleaned and reassembled after every 15 hours of flying. Mm. That would have been a massive job in itself. Um, so it stayed in issue for a long time. I mean, it was bought by a former employee in the 1920s who took it out on one flight and crashed it and it gave up, spent its time in a shed. In the 1930s it was offered to the Australian Museum they thought about it, we declined it. It stayed in the shed for another 20 years until the 1950s when they decided it was of historic interest and they bought it. Now the significance of this plane, apart from the, its appearance in Gawler, it's the same plane of course that made the Melbourne to Sydney uh, in 1914. So the plane now hangs from the ceiling of the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney. So if you're ever in Sydney, go to the big huge uh, boiler room at the back of the Powerhouse Museum and it's hanging from the ceiling. It's been, been really well restored, uh, which is quite good when you think that uh, three of uh, South Australia's most famous air miles, the planes still exist. Now, Kerry went on, he actually bought some war, some, uh, war surplus aeroplanes uh, after the war, and he built up a business doing joy flights, passenger flights, aerial photography. He was a pioneer in aerial photography and uh, promotional flights. And uh, this is a Morris Farman uh, aircraft. And this, these planes were used to promote anything and everything in country Victoria. And uh, this was one of his last flights. Um, it was uh, on the coronation day in 1937. So, so by which time he'd been well into his 70s. Now, now we move up to 1957 the first time that this particular flight was reenacted. Now Nelson Eustace, who I mentioned before, owned a hobby store in Adelaide, and he was a stamp dealer, hobby dealer, model dealer, and all sorts of things, and he has a passion for um, aviation uh, related items. Now because Carey was probably one of the last of the great aviators still alive in the late 50s, uh, Nelson got the idea that he would promote a reenactment flight get Kerry over here to participate in the flight and sell souvenir envelopes and put on that flight. He approached the Postmaster General's department and they said for a 40th anniversary it wasn't of great significance, so, but, but they, they said they, they would help him with the flight and carry the mail. So here's an advertisement for carrying letters on that mail. And so the next slide shows the actual envelopes that were produced. Now, Nelson persuaded the post office that he believed he could get 30,000 of these things bought and sold and carried on the flight. He fell a bit short, there was only 12,000 that were done. Um, but at two bob a throw, he still made a lot of money and he charged an extra two bob to get them autographed by Kerry. <laughs> so he was a pretty, as I said, he was a good hustler. Okay. 
Uh, Kerry came over in 57, and he, this is Nelson Eustace with a older your mom of an aeroplane. And this is Kerry arriving in Adelaide uh, with his uh, daughter Maisie and his second wife. And uh, next, uh, the next slide. Thank you. Uh, Nelson chartered a DC-3 from Guinea Airways and he filled it up with a whole heap of people. Um, dignitaries, philatelists, aviation enthusiasts and I actually have a list of all the people that participated in that flight um, because they all signed souvenir envelopes in it. So obviously there was the, the, three, the three carries. There's a gentleman called Ted Roberts who was a designer and designed all of the, of the envelope designs. Nelson used this of course gentleman from the Griffin Press who printed all of those things, uh, uh, Mr. Starrick who made the uh, model of the aeroplane, Mr. Stokes and Marks from the Philatelic Council, and Mr. Howe who was a cinema, photo, um, a cinema photographer, uh, Mel, Thomas, uh, Mel Cameron and M.A. Thomas from 5DN, and that's Mel Cameron there. Mm. I'm, not, I'm not sure who all these people are, but... Uh, there's Mr. Kennehan from Advertising Newspapers, Mr. Bear and Mr. Collis from the Postmaster General's Department, uh, along with a Mr. Smith. Uh, there was a Blake Brownrig from News Limited. Uh, Brownrig used to do a column, a bit like Ray Pokemon's column and things like that, you know, general newsy events of the day. He was there with his son, Peter. Hayden and Bunton and Mr. Trost from the, the News were on there. Uh, Bill Whitber, who flew the, uh, the plane at Bolivar. Um, he flew over from Kangaroo Island where he was living at the time to uh, join the flight. Uh, Mr Christie who's the advertiser photographer, uh, Mr Lilly from Guinea Airway and Mr Templeton from ABC Television. Uh, which begs the question, you just really wonder if, the, if there is some film of these things uh, about. Uh, the pilot on the day was Nobby Buckley and uh, First Officer Jay Robbins and presumably the lady here is uh, Miss Robinson who was the air hostess. Um, this gentleman is Howard Marks who was a stamp dealer, this gentleman was Ted Roberts and the other one I can't, I can't identify if anyone could help that would be great. So they all came along. Pretty rare to get a picture of inside an airplane. Here's the Guinea Airways DC-3 on the airfield at Gawler. It's the only, it's the only photo I know of it. Uh, the Gawler Bunyip report of the day said there was about 500 people there to greet it. And, uh, it's quite a good deal of them. The, the mailbags were handed over, special mailbags, there was actually four mailbags on this particular flight with 12,000 letters to carry. And here's one of them, which we'll be, which we'll be using for the centenary flight. Uh, so it's pretty good that we've got a 60 year old mailbag to continue the tradition. Now the gentleman there is Nobby Buckley, who was the pilot. Uh, this is Graham Carey. Now, this gentleman here is a gentleman called Walter Nelson, who lived in Gawler in 1917, and he came out to the race course to meet the plane, or see the plane, and when Carey got out of the plane with his bag of mail, wondering what to do with it, he spotted Nelson there, because he was uh, still dressed in his um, uniform. So he handed Nelson and he hightailed it back to the Gordon Post Office to deliver the bag of mail. And Nelson uh, participated in uh, uh, three of the reenactments of receiving the mail bag. <coughs> right. So that's it, Gary and Nelson. Now, I mentioned before that there were a list of people who all come from these envelopes where everybody that was on the plane signed them. If you're an autograph collector, you do well with those. And that was the list I just read out. Okay. Move on. Now, we'll move on 10 years. Uh, sadly, uh, Carey himself died in 1959, so he didn't participate in any more. But for the 50th anniversary, Australia Post, were, or PMG's department as it was then, were a bit more uh, cooperative with producing a commemorative postmark and carrying the mail. This is Nobby Buckley uh, in front of a Piper Aztec, and uh, that was you. That was a chart for the day. Uh, the next picture shows the plane on the Gawler Racecourse uh, in, in all its glory, and all painted up as well. So obviously, the Nelson, being an entrepreneur, had all these contacts to get these things done, which we 
find difficult to get done nowadays as volunteers. So there was 12,000 letters carried in 57, there was 9,500 carried in 67. And here we have Hurst Carey, who was Graham Carey's son, um, with Walter Nelson again and Robbie Buckley handing over the mailbag, a particular one for the 50th anniversary, which we've not been able to locate. Hurst Carey, for those who are, are bookworms, is Peter Carey's father, so the famous author. Okay, once again said, because the, because the 1957, uh, they were anticipating 30,000 letters to be sold and only sold 12, they actually just overprinted the ones from 57 and kept selling them. And, but Australia po uh, did do a special postmark up for the day. And in addition to that, they also produced a replica postcard in the 1917 one as a souvenir that obviously Nelson did to, uh, and so Nelson used this did to defray some of the expenses of chartering the plane and the like. And in 67 was the first year also where I found that the Mayor of Adelaide exchanged letters with the Mayor of Gawler. But I still don't really know the historic connection with that. Ten years later, there was another anniversary. That picture that just flashed by was in 1977. And once again, they did envelopes, but they, well, they did postmarks for mails going each way. And, but the interest in the flatless was even starting to die out in the 1970s. Uh, so there were about 4,500 envelopes carried each way on that day. And that particular flight was also by Nobby Buckley at a pipe Now, in 1992, for the 75th anniversary, uh, the ARDU, that's the uh, Aircraft Research and Development Unit of the RAF, were contacted and they flew a Dakota, which was a military version of the uh, DC-3, and carried a special airmail. We should go back one. Back two now. It's frustrating. You've got to get it back down to original size so we can scroll. Australia Post did these special envelopes and there was two printings of these, one for the mail from Adelaide to Gawler, one for the mail from Gawler to Adelaide and the first printing, uh, although you can't see it there, they actually misspelled anniversary and had to destroy the entire printing and get it redone. <laughs> so if anybody ever sees one where anniversary is spelled anniversity, at the end, <laughs> that, that's, you've got a rare thing. Tell Martin. <laughs> back into the others again. I have to shrink them back to the usual yes. size. Yes, I don't understand what you're doing. The, the Airmail Society was also at that time raising funds for an airmail <coughs> exhibition in 1994 for the 75th anniversary of the Rosnan Kid Smith flight from uh, England to Australia. So they also did these special cards and they, they sold them as fundraisers. And here we have the ceremonial mailbag handover. So this is squadron leader Storbaum um, from the, the RAF and Irvin Armstrong, who was the postmaster of Gawler at the time. And at this, at this particular time, the Australia Post stopped keeping records of how many letters they carried on these particular anniversaries. So I can't tell you that. Right. We now move on to 1997, and this is where Bruce gets involved. And uh, Ardu was, was recruited again to fly the 80th anniversary airmail. Now, the 80th is an odd anniversary, but the significance of this is um, Carrie's daughter, uh, Bertha, was actually still alive in 1997, and she came along for the ride. So this is a, an ex-army Iroquois helicopter uh, that made the, uh, the journey from Edinburgh to to Parafield and then up to the Gawler Racecourse. It actually landed on the Gawler Racecourse, as you can see there. And, uh, so we'll have to move to the next one. And uh, here we have Bertha, uh, who's Kerry's daughter, youngest daughter, and Edith Martin, who wrote the biography that I was telling you about, and, Ker the, <coughs> and Kerry's granddaughter. And uh, Edith will be coming up to the anniversary in a few weeks' time, coming over with several members of the Kerry family. So there they are with the mail bags that they carried on that particular flight. And the pilot on the day was uh, Senator David Fawcett. Oh, right. He was in the RAF, yes. 
he was the CEO of the Arduin at the time. Oh, right. And here's one of the ceremonial letters being exchanged uh, from Bertha delivering it to the then mayor, Bruce. <laughs> Now this is also when the monument at the race course was put in and uh, that was unveiled on that particular day. So the, the next slide shows the flag landing. So and that, of course is still there. Now we've, uh, Tony Piccolo has arranged with the DPTI, um, or fulfilled a promise from 10 years ago actually, uh, that a monument sign <laughs> highlighting the location of this will be unveiled on the day later this month oh. and that was felt necessary because when the soaring club contacted the jockey club to ask about um, having, having an event near the monument um, they said what monument so it's been in the corner of their race course for 20 years and they didn't even know it was there <laughs> some did right. yes. some knew it was there yes. <laughs> yeah. um, as well as the helicopter when the uh, monument was unveiled they released a load of pigeons carrying these flimsies sort of a commemorative thing, knowing Nelson, a fundraising thing as well. And then after the monument was unveiled, we all hightailed it down to the hall on Adelaide Road and had a good nosh up. Um, that model plane that was there in the picture for 1957, well here it is again in 1997, I'm trying to track it down for this year if I can find it. We, we believe it still exists, uh, so it'd be nice. And uh, Bertha Harvey stood in front of the plane. Now, for the 90th anniversary, uh, this was flown by Mick Wright in an Oster out of the Gore Airfield. Mick's a member of the Antique Aircraft Association and the Adelaide Soaring Club. And uh, health permitting, he'll be doing the flight in uh, a few weeks' time. Once again, souvenirs were done, so here's me preparing the souvenir covers on the day so I can get postmarked and autographed. It all has to be done in a big rush because they don't, you can't pre-do all of these thing, things at the moment. And there we have uh, Mick Wright, the gentleman on your right. Uh, Nigel Dorp, the gentleman in the middle. Uh, Nigel's uh, involved with the South Australian Aviation Museum and the West Beach Aircraft Group, which are the, the plane spotters that you see next to the airport. And uh, Bob Hindle, who was the post, post manager at the time. And there's a whole bunch of us there. And that day was actually the, the day Brian and I first met. Mm. So you can see Brian stood in for Brian Sample mm. um, and, and, and deputy mayor. And uh, of course Tony Piccolo on the other end. And that was one of the on special envelopes carried on that flight. So moving on to this year. Uh, this is the logo for the flight anniversary. Uh, this was an, a, a, done by a, a Sydney aeroplane artist called uh, Juanita Franzi who did the 2014 one for the uh, Melbourne Sydney anniversary, so it's an adaption of that. And of course the triangular design from, which we took from the mailbag. And uh, that's going on these souvenir envelopes which have been produced. And it's also on the souvenir postcard. And the souvenir postcard, because I could not find a picture of Kerry in Adelaide or in Gawler, that was a suitable quality, we've done a colourised version of the 1917 card has come up very well and uh, a number of those will be carried on the day with these peace stamps don't know how many people know about peace stamps so these are things that you can get your own designs on so they've been ordered and a special postmark has been arranged with the Australian Post and that will be in use at the Gawler Post Office on the day and that is actually an adaption of a 1967 rejected design so there. now the details what's happening on the 23rd Scroll it down. Yes. Okay, so we'll be taking uh, because Australia Post won't let sort of non-contract people carry mail officially. So what we're doing is we're getting a whole heap of mail postmarked and delivered at Gawler and then flown on the plane, and then the mail coming back from Adelaide will be flown on the plane and then posted at Gawler. That's the only way we can get around their rules. So on Thursday morning at 9:30, the mail from Gawler. Uh, will be delivered to the airfield. They will take off at 10.30. And now Mick Wright is expected to be the pilot on the day. Mark Michelle is a gentleman with the pit special that you might see on a Saturday afternoon doing the stunt flying over the airfield. Uh, that's him. 
Uh, they'll fly down to Parafield where they'll be met by members of the Airmail Society in the Aviation Museum and there'll be an exchange of mail bags there and then they'll return to Gawler overflying the race course and they will then load the mail bags into a veteran car which I think is still being organised at this point in time but I think there's one in the wings coming and that will then take that to the Gawler race course where there'll be a ceremony at one o'clock on that afternoon uh, featuring the Gawler Jockey Club will be hosting us. I'll be introducing people. Uh, the Mayor will give a, a talk and receive the letters from the dignitaries, the Speaker of the House of Assembly and the President of the Commercial Travellers Association. Hopefully from Edith. It's the last one. It's the last one, yes. Uh, hopefully from Edith Martin, uh, Kerry's granddaughter. Yeah. And then yeah. Tony will unveil the sign and then will deliver the letters that came from Parafield to the Gordon Post Office to go into the mail and then we'll all depart the uh, club rooms of the Adelaide Soaring Club for a meal and a repeat of this talk and uh, hopefully a, f a few other insights since we'll have people like, as I say, Care members of the Carey family uh, will be there and they'll be able to give more details than what I'll ever be able to give. So that's my passion for early airmails and in particular the first airmail that came to Gordon in 1917. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Yes, Bruce. Bruce. One of the features of the uh, air flight was for the Mayor of Adelaide, Lord Mayor of Adelaide, to deliver a letter to the Mayor of Gawler. And here's a copy of the one which came yes. up in 1997. Wonderful. I'm glad you kept a copy. Yes. The daughter, who was here, took part in the ceremony of the unveiling of the obelisk which is down there on the corner on Adelaide Road and uh, she uh, was uh, a, uh, a very committed person she was a was on the other end of the flag with myself but they're two pieces of information for the future. We, we, we did try and track down all the letters that went to the Mayor of Gawler but with the redevelopment going on with the Institute and the Town Hall at the moment, everything is in storage, so we weren't able to yeah. see those, but it's wonderful that you brought those along. Yes. As um, Blerio's aeroplane was quite important to this bit of history, is there anything known about what happens to Blerio? Blerio, the, the pilot, well, the, the manufacturer. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure it's well recorded, I, I can't tell you off the top of my head what happened to him, but... I just thought yes. you might have done because it's yes. so important to the story, isn't it? Yes, well, it, well Blerio himself never came came to Australia, so, as I said, he... And then he went back for the war? No, Gio yes. went back for the war. Gio, Gio was the person who brought that plane to Australia. Yes, it's Gio. Yes, question on that. Do we know uh, <coughs> how long these uh, flights took? The, 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 the newspaper report said it took 30 minutes, uh, the DC-3 took 6 minutes I think and the little Pipers took 8 minutes. Yes. Right. Um, Martin, it's interesting to note that uh, the later mail bags they used were not the typical airmail blue bags and that was brought about by instruction from the um, headquarters of Australia Post that uh, that's the bags that they needed printed up. So I did notice that you know, everything blue for MR, yep. the later ones were white, which was a standard uh, three footer. Yes, John. I think from memory that the plaque was stolen 20 odd years ago. It wasn't stolen, it fell off. It and, fell off. And it fell off, and the council workers sort of just realised it was laying on the ground, so they took it, and nobody knew where it was because they took it to their shed and just left it there oh. and didn't tell anyone. And it was actually the ML Society who wrote to the council inquiring what had happened to the plaque. And, uh, oh. and obviously, when some interest was attracted, they found it and uh, put some decent glue on it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, so back in 1917, how fast would flying the mail have been compared to just the regular 
the regular mail from Adelaide's building? Well, in 1917, the mail would have come up on the train, which in that time would have been about, about a 45-minute trip. So the train was slower, but it had to stop at a lot less places there. Pleasure to ask Peter Hoy to give a vote of thanks on behalf of us all here tonight. If you could go over close together, please, Peter. Well, <coughs> when I uh, opened up the email from Brian to all of us uh, notifying about this uh, tonight's meeting and the subject, I thought to myself, is Brian now trying out a lend of us or something? You know, it never occurred to me that there could be a airmail service from Adelaide to uh, Gorland. But uh, especially uh, in a machine that uh, takes off and lands on frame wheels. Uh, you know, I think to myself, you've got to be joking. <laughs> but there you are, you know, we've learned something and it's been a, a, a marvellous uh, presentation. Certainly uh, very uh, informative, I'm sure that all of us I've certainly learned something. Thanks very much. Thank you. Tonight's dinner. <laughs>